the Qing Dynasty, the first empire in China. Not good enough, not good enough. The first unified China that we've seen, still not good enough. The first time we see China as we think of it today and as we know it today. That's better. Let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Austin in China and today we are talking about the Qin Dynasty. This dynasty came about because of and put it into the Warring States period because in about 230 BC, the Qin began to conquer all of the states around what is now China. And in 221, bam, we have a new dynasty that only lasts for, what, 15 years? 15 years. And it's actually one of the most important dynasties because it laid the very foundations for China as we know it today. And I mean, as we get into it, you'll see a lot got done in 15 years because its echoes are still all around me, all around everyone in China and the world today. Taking it back a little bit, the Qin state was located in what is now Shanxi province at this place called Shenyang. And it served as sort of a buffer state between the Zhou and the other states at the time who were at war, warring states period, a lot of war, okay. Yes, but the thing is, they were not, although they were a buffer zone and were sort of useful to the Zhou, the Zhou didn't like them very much. They were considered kind of backward and kind of a little bit barbaric, not such, they weren't great people to be around. But the Qin didn't let that stop them and they tried all these different ways to try and ingratiate themselves with the Qin or to try and improve their social standing or political standing around the area, including things like marriage, for example. That's the most common way that people kind of built up their status. But that still begs the question, how did the Qin, one state, conquer all of these other states? One state against all these? It's kind of crazy, right? Well, that is because of the Duke of Xiao and his chancellor, Shangyang. Let's talk about this guy, because I think this guy laid the foundations for the Qin dynasty. Without him, none of this other stuff would have even happened. Xiangyang is crucial in study of this period because it's one of the greatest representations of Chinese legalism. And because of two theories mainly, treating the people as one and also fixing the standards. Well, let's first talk about fixing the standards. Across the Kingdom of Qin at the time, different regions had different standards when it came to like uh, different currencies, different weights, different measures, different ways of, well, looking at everything. So. Why don't we standardize everything so that no matter where people are across the kingdom, they all speak sort of the same language. That was one thing. They use the same weights for another thing. They use the same measures. They use the same currency. They use the same everything. This is the way to go, right? Very progressive. He is, by definition, a reformer, a systematic reformer, and he created this massive bureaucracy that in one form or another still exists today. China is still a heavily bureaucratic state. But what did he do to actually conquer everyone else? Well, for one thing, he built up the army. And how did he do that? Now, before all of this happened, the army was made up of the nobility. Only the noble could take part in the military and could fight in war, but not according to Shangyang. He opened it up for commoners, commoners, peasants, anyone could go in and based on rank and based on achievements in the army, when you were done with the army, you would be given plots of land. Wow, that's great. So if you're a peasant who doesn't really have much, you don't have anything, you can join the army, fight for the Qin, and then afterwards you would be given land, and then you could begin a whole new life. That sounds pretty good, right? But one thing he did that was a little bit hairy was he stripped the nobility from nobles who didn't want to fight, or tried to pay other people to fight so that they didn't want to. Can't do that. The policy is you have to fight, right? Otherwise, I'm taking your stuff. So you've got this reformed military, you've got maybe a few nobles who have been stripped of their titles and maybe of their lands for not joining the army. And you've also got the idea of doubly taxing households that have more than one son. And this was done in order to break up the clans. It partly abolished primogeniture, really. Uh, that was a really big deal because family is such an important thing in China but then you doubly tax and you get rid of primogeniture and you do this for really big clans, 
Now that's a way to get people angry at you, but it is a way to break people up into smaller nuclear families. He also freed convicts who worked on clearing the land for agriculture because he wanted China to be a more agricultural society instead of a society centered within cities. And what he also did was say, hey, we need to be more loyal to the state than to your clan, more loyal to the government than to your family. And this was another thing because, again, regional differences, clan history, clan, you know, clan, clan, clan. It's, clans are such a big thing, warlords at this time. So these are measures that were put in place to fight against that. And also the idea of enslaving farmers who couldn't meet quotas and rewarding farmers who could meet quotas. Now, I don't know about this whole enslaving thing, but, you know, it's something, it's, it's an idea, it's a reform. As with any time in history, big changes are accompanied by hate, widespread hate, and the nobility hated Xiangyang so much. Upon the Duke Xiao's death, the nobility were after him. He, you know, there are all these different accounts, but he either like ran away or he was exiled or he tried to raise his own army to fight against these nobles. He tried to create his own state. Like there are all these different stories, but basically what is agreed upon is that he was executed in like somewhere around 338, something like that. Not just executed, he was like pulled apart. He was drawn and quartered essentially, but I think it was five horses they tied him to all different directions, just pulled that mofo apart. And you know, that was the end of him. But the thing is, we talk about this guy, we talk about Xiangyang because you'll see the reforms that the Qin dynasty put into place later, and you'll know how important he is. The conquest began with the states of Shu and Ba, which is actually where I live, in Sichuan, present day Sichuan. And these two kingdoms were going at it, they were going at it, going at it, and they asked the Qin for help. And the Qin's like, mm, you know what, I can help you. And they goes in and conquers these two states. And over the next like 40 years, they start moving thousands and thousands of families and businesses and things like that to promote their interest down in these kingdoms. And that was the very beginning of it. Now, the very next kingdom to fall, I believe, was the Zhao. And after that, just state after state after state. I believe there are five more after that. And then 221 BC, we have a unified China for the first time. Everyone is under the Qin umbrella. Wow, I mean, this is a huge step in China's history. Here we go. Now we've got China. And even the argument of the Qin dynasty, the name Qin, Qin, ah, China, China. China comes from the Qin dynasty. That's one of the arguments, anyway, for the origin of the name of this country. The Qin dynasty is established. We have a united China golf clap. The Qin had one fantastic. And we have this new emperor who decides to give himself a new title. He decides to call himself an emperor, whereas before we didn't have emperors. We just had rulers. So he decides to call himself Qin Shi. So the first Qin and then Huang Di, emperor. So you've got this combination in Chinese of like mythical ruler of God, and then you've got the first of this dynasty. And wow, what a name! What a name, Qin Shi Huang Di. Here's a big problem, though, Mr. Qin. You've got all this new territory right here, but the thing is, how are you going to rule it? Everyone's speaking different languages, everyone is using different weights and measures, everyone's got different cultural standards. Every hold on, let's go back and use Xiang Yang's ideas. How about that? And that's exactly what happened. Qin Shi Huang put into effect all of these measures to standardize the script all across China so that now for the first time, people all across the country, what is now a country, can communicate with each other, can do business with each other, have ways to exchange ideas and to, you know, build commerce. And like, this is a massive deal. And what also happened is that you know, all this led to kind of maybe the idea of standardizing thought, and this led to the creation of an imperial academy, and it led to the collection, the confiscation of various like regional texts, and they were confiscated and held for later while sending out all the standardized ones to different provinces, different areas of the country. And he not only did this with the language and to a certain degree with thought, 
but he did this with the money and all of this other stuff that we talked about with Shang Yang. Just immediately, these measures went into place. And you know what? Let's not stop with language. Let's not stop with weights, measures, and currency. Let's build roads all across the country. Let's build 4,000 miles of road and a 500 mile super highway that connects different parts of the country together. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Dude, this guy is going crazy with this country in the best way. You may not have heard of the straight road. You may not have heard of these highways, but these, this highway, these roads were used to transport materials across China to build something called the Great Wall of China. I think you've heard of that. The Great Wall of China, guess what? Began to be built during this dynasty. Now I keep talking about all this great stuff that he did, but as a person, he was kind of weird. He had this thing for self-glorification and just being like extra. And so for, for example, at his palace, he had this palace, right? As all emperors do, he, whenever he would conquer a new place, so this is before even all of China was united, when he would conquer a new state, a new kingdom, a new warlord, across from where he lived, across from his palace, he would build a replica of the conquered person's palace and fill it with girls who would sing and play instruments. Like, and those girls would be from the conquered place. So they, he would not only conquer them, he'd take some of the ladies, get them to perform in a replica of their leader's house, sing songs to their new emperor. And he would connect all of these little mini palaces together uh, along the riverside across from his own palace. Like, whoa. But wait, there's more. <laughs> not only that, the weapons from his enemies, his conquered enemies, he would bring in all these weapons that are made from, you know, iron and bronze or whatever weapons are made from, steel. And they would be melted down and then used for, for statues all around the capital of Shenyang as well. So it's like not only do they get conquered and they get their girls sent over here to these replica palaces, but they get their stuff melted down. It's, man, and also... And, and wait, there's even more. <laughs> wait, there's even more. So this guy had this sorceress named Lu Sheng, and she made these predictions about how he would be assassinated, how you know he should be afraid for his life. So he had all these like networks of tunnels. He had all these like networks of tunnels. People were forbidden from knowing his location. He would communicate with people through like writing and this and that. And it was everything was just this huge mask of secrecy. He was so afraid of being discovered. Not only that, people were forbidden from using his personal name in legal documents, in imperial documents, and anyone who did do that or who revealed his location, told anybody where he was, they would be executed. Dang. Like, you guys know that movie, Hero, right? Jet Li, awesome movie. Yeah, it's about that guy. That guy right there. He's not a popular guy, so he took a lot of measures, maybe Maybe a little bit extra, but wait, there's more. The most extra achievement by Qin Shi Huang was the thing that we all know him for. He sent 700,000 workers down to the foot of the Lishan Mountains and got them building, 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 constructing this massive complex. Temples, administrative buildings, animals, like houses and people. And this is like, he built an entire city that he could rule from from the grave, from the afterlife. And next to that, just outside what I believe, I believe was the East Gate, just outside the East Gate, he built what we now know as the Terracotta Warriors. The Terracotta Army, the Terracotta Warriors, one of the seven wonders of the world, built by the same guy who did all of the stuff we just talked about. So you've got like 8,000 soldiers, about 600 like horses, and you've got chariots, and you've got an entire city that you've built around it. There's even like a fish pond in there. I think they built like a river and like a fish pond. What the heck? And then not only that, we still don't know everything that's in the tomb because it's said that he created all these rivers throughout his tomb made of mercury, mercury rivers. And the level of mercury around the site is so high that the excavation of the tomb is still like not, it's not done. They can't do it. And well done on him, I suppose, for getting this all done very, very quickly because he did die fairly soon afterwards. The dynasty only lasted about 15 years, and some of that was not even him. 
And the thing is, we know that he didn't like people knowing where he is or his status or things like that. So after he died, the the escort around him where he was, they had all of these carts filled with dead fish because they didn't want people to know that he was dead. They didn't want people to smell his body. Oof. Some of the officials of Qin Shi Huang actually like forged letters from him to other people, including one of his sons. Like they sent a letter to one of his sons and said, hey, son, you need to commit suicide so that your younger brother can rule in your stead. And he did, he did. Why did he do that? I don't understand. I need to look more into this. I just wanted to make the video, but I should do another video about that. Why did he do that? Qin was not popular. <laughs> Qin Shi Huang was not popular. And by the end of Qin Shi Huang's reign and his death, especially after his death, the entire nation is in revolt against him because of these legalistic principles, super harsh punishments and all of that. And there's this guy named Xiang Yu who comes in and he conquers everything and he executes um, Qin Shi Huang's uh, younger son and then splits China up into 18 little states ruled by warlords. But don't click away just yet. We've got another guy named Liu Bang who comes in and he starts fighting with Xiang Yu. And Xiang Yu and Liu Bang are fighting over and over and over. And this for a long time, Liu Bang starts winning and winning and Xiang Yu is like, Oh, I'm so bummed out right now. And he commits suicide in Liu Bang, who comes from a place called the Han River Valley. Does that sound familiar? The Han River Valley. He comes in, Liu Bang, he establishes a new dynasty called the Han Dynasty. So now we have this transition of power from the Qin to Xiang Yu, then to the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty is a story we'll have to tell another time. So there we have it, the Qin Dynasty, the shortest dynasty in Chinese history, but possibly one of the most important because of everything that we've talked about in this video. So thank you all very much for watching. If you'd like to support me in this kind of content, please look at my link tree down below. You'll see links to all of my social media platforms and ways to support the channel. So that's about it. I'll see you all next time.